Oh, good morning. You know, uh, that looks like a wonderful time. I think, I think ladies need time away from men, all men. Yeah. Did you see how happy they looked? <laughs> I don't know what to do at those meetings, but uh, they, they looked awfully happy. It'll be a good time. Well, perhaps you notice I'm a little limpy and gimpy and wimpy this morning. I, I'm afraid I have an occasional visitor, uh, completely unwelcomed acquaintance from time to time called gout. I've had it in my feet. I've had it in my ankles. And these last couple of uh, weeks, I've had it in my knees. And it's the worst case I've ever had. At least that's my self-diagnosis. I'm going to go and find out for sure. But uh, I'm limping today, but uh, I'm lifted at the same time. I am so thrilled to have this opportunity uh, to preach from God's good word this morning. And I think I'm ready now. I came in this morning, and the pastor said my belt was off to the side. You need to straighten that up. Okay, he said your tie was so off to the side. So I've had a front-end alignment. <laughs> and uh, at my age, you know, you need that more often. And I... Uh, I appreciate his watchful eye and his concern. We're good to go now. All right. <laughs> Come hear him preach tonight. He'll pick up where I'm leaving off, and it will be a great, uh, a great Sunday. Uh, are, you, are you ready? Are you ready for Easter? Uh, we're going to get a dose of it this morning. You know, Easter ought to be acknowledged and celebrated, I think, more than just once a year. It's the greatest event in history, the greatest day in history, and we only talk about it once a year. The resurrection message is always appropriate. And uh, I, I think it's, I fear it's underemphasized by the church. In fact, there's a lot of things, most things biblical are being underemphasized in today's church. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, would you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. We're going to stop reading at verse 11, but we'll, we'll journey down a few verses past that. But look at this wonderful message and wonderful hope that you and I have today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. This very thorough response to the preaching of the gospel. And by this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass, passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures he is talking about are most likely those Old Testament Scriptures that anticipated the coming and the suffering and the death of Christ. Uh, those Scriptures that uh, would be put into written form uh, taken from the gospel accounts. And he will reference the scriptures again. Verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The, the cohesiveness of scripture. You know, the, the agnostic, the unbeliever always comes at us and says, oh, the Bible is full of contradictions. No, it's not. The Bible never contradicts itself. It complements and completes itself. It is a beautiful, united, cohesive revelation of God's truth. So he was buried, raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, verse 5, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. And he adds the footnote, most of whom are still living. We can tell you who they are. You can go talk to them. They'll verify what I'm saying. Though some of them have fallen asleep, that beautiful description of the Christian's death. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, 
Paul says, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, born in a different time. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Boy, did he. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. Someone recently asked me if I ever preached on prophecy. My answer was a smug and frivolous. No, I let others mess you up. But I, I do preach on prophetic events. We have to acknowledge there are things in Scripture and in the, in the community, Christian community, that we, we can agree to disagree on, particularly in this realm of eschatology. Eschatology is a theological term for end time or last day events. And so we're not going to agree on every, every little detail. We can debate, we can debate long and hard on the identity of Gog and Magog and the Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet and the meaning of 666 and when all of that comes down. But I'm not going to go there this morning. I'm, I'm going to limit my thoughts to preach about those things that I can preach about with absolute assurance. The non-negotiables of our faith those truths that are clearly stated and reiterated in the Scriptures. I am going to preach on a future event today, so in that sense it is prophetic. Today we're going to talk about the resurrection. You've heard of Christmas in July. This is Easter in August. So adjust your Easter bonnets and let's do it. First of all, we see from our text this morning that a resurrection is required. Paul builds the case for that. A resurrection is required. Without the resurrection, we're out of business. We can uh, turn out the lights and lock the doors and go home and maybe sell the building. In fact, if we don't believe in the resurrected Jesus... We should do that. That's a rather dramatic statement, but uh, you look like a crowd that can handle that. I've been wrong before, but <laughs> the emphasis on the resurrection is more than a they lived happily ever after footnote to the Jesus story. It's a lot bigger than that. The resurrection, it's not optional equipment. It's not an ingenious but desperate concoction of disillusioned disciples trying to salvage Jesus' reputation after a brutal and bloody, bloody crucifixion. Without the resurrection, there truly is no Christian faith. The resurrection of Jesus is absolutely essential to any hope we have. So here's the way the Apostle Paul presents it. First of all, in verse 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And preaching was a big deal for the Apostle Paul. Look in verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. And in verse 2. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. And in verse 11, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. In verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. Verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So, yes, preaching was a big deal to Paul, but he says, without the resurrection, all that is in vain. 
Our best efforts in preaching the gospel have been a, a, a total waste. We're just talking nonsense. Can you imagine giving your life to something that proves to be, in the end, total nonsense? That would be an especially tormenting thought for Paul, who paid, by the way, such a severe price for the privilege of preaching. He catalogs that suffering in 2 Corinthians. He was in danger wherever he went. It didn't matter, city or country, land or sea, among Jews or Gentiles. He was stoned, beaten, thrown into prison. That was a good day for Paul. I'm not sure you'd ever want to ask the Apostle Paul, how was your day? I mean, it'd be okay to ask, how are you doing? I mean, I know what Paul would say if you asked him that. didn't matter what kind of day he had. But if you ask him, how are you doing? I'm sure that he would say, I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I have learned in whatever circumstances I am in, therewith to be content. So it's all right to ask Paul, how are you doing? But... You might not want to ask him, how was your day? Well, first I got run out of town. Then they stoned me and they left me for dead, but I didn't die. Then I went into another town where they beat me and they threw me into prison. Then when I got out of prison, they ran me out of that town. Then I got on a ship. The ship ran into a storm. The ship wrecked. We swam to the island. And the natives there tried to kill me. Then I got bit by a snake, but the snake didn't kill me. <laughs> so I'm not sure that you really want to ask Paul, how was your day? Besides, you might get it in return. He might ask you, how was your day? And compared to his day, whoa. Me? Well, I had a little acid reflux. Took a couple of tums. I'm fine now. <laughs> he was without food, without clothes, without water, without sleep without warmth, without rest, without companionship. And yet this man says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Why? Because he knew it was true. Because he knew the central character of the gospel was alive. Because he knew that Christ had been raised from the dead. Could I get an amen? amen? Hallelujah. He goes on to say that if Christ has not been raised, then, then our faith, our faith is useless. Whose faith? Well, the faith of the Christian. Because you see, the resurrection of Christ from the dead is the linchpin of the Christian faith. Our faith and our hope are all predicated upon the resurrection of of Jesus. If he was raised from the dead, then our faith makes all kinds of sense. <laughs> if he has not been raised from the dead, our faith makes no sense. And again, turn out the lights, lock the doors, sell the building. You see, it's all built on the resurrection of one man, but what a man. The one Paul calls in Timothy, writing to Timothy, the man Christ Jesus. The one who is the resurrection and the life. The one who was dead, but now is alive forevermore. Paul goes on to say in verse 15, if Christ has not been raised, then we're all false witnesses. If Christ is not raised from the dead, where does that leave us, preacher? of the gospel. What does it make of any Christian witness? Well, we are the blind leading the blind. We are deceived and deceiving others. We are in a ditch and we're pulling others in. And then one more thing Paul says, if Christ is not raised, we're still in our sins. And notice in verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. 
hopelessly lost in your sins, no way out. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they're lost. They have no hope. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So did you get that? If there is no empty tomb, if there is no risen Jesus, if there is no living Lord, we are in our sins and we are lost and we are to be pitied. But they call this good news. In fact, the word gospel means good news. Paul now shows us that his resurrection, Christ's resurrection, is recorded. We have a resurrection is required. We have now the, his resurrection is recorded. And Paul presents the gospel he preached. And the first aspect of that gospel in verse 3 is that Christ died for our sins. He was put to death by a Roman crucifixion. There have always been theories that uh, Jesus didn't really die, that he swooned and was then resuscitated in the cool tomb in which he was buried. So there have been those agnostic proponents of that belief that he, there was a resuscitation, not a resurrection. There's some problems with that. No one ever survived. No one ever survived a Roman crucifixion. The executioners were experts, and their professionals proclaimed Jesus to be dead. And a soldier's spear proved he had bled out, and any attempt to revive him on anyone's part would have been ludicrous. Christ died with professional documentation. And then, he said, Paul says in verse 4, he was buried. Dead and buried. Buried among the dead. And I've often wondered the impact that had on those disciples when they witnessed that stone being rolled into place. And when that stone sealed the tomb, it must have been a sight and a sound that his followers would never forget. The world never felt so hopeless, nor was the future so dreaded. He was buried. He was gone. It was over, so it seemed. But of course, then Paul continues layering truth upon truth, and in verse 4, He reminds us that Christ not only died, not only was he buried, but he was raised. In verse 4, Paul says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. He was raised. The three most important words since let there be in Genesis. He died, he was buried. He was raised. Angelic attestation followed that empty tune. He is not here. He is risen. Paul goes on to say, that's not the end of the story, folks. He was seen. Oh, yes. His companion in ministry, Dr. Luke, will say he was seen, that he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. And Paul gives the litany, a list here of those who were witnesses, eyewitnesses, up close and personal witnesses of the resurrected one. He said he was seen by Peter, by the twelve, by more than 500 brothers, by James, by all the apostles, by me also. So, my friend, what do you do with that? If you have the leanings of a skeptic, what do you do with that? How do you handle it? How do you explain it away? Do you simply dismiss these people off as liars and frauds? Do you conclude that this is a conspiracy invented by the disciples to make him into a deity? The problem with that is almost every one of his apostles died for the cause. (laughs) died rather than deny 
Christ as the one and only Son of God. Most people aren't willing to die for something they don't truly believe in. And Paul cites a variety of people. James is one of them. James for good reason because James was Jesus' half-brother and James wasn't really a believer. He was conflicted about Jesus until the resurrection. And when he saw the resurrected Jesus, James became a believer and a leader in the church. And when he wrote his letter, he introduced himself not as James, the brother of Jesus, but James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, all oh, the historians have had fun with Paul trying to explain away Paul's radical conversion. Paul can't be explained aside from the resurrection of Jesus and his appearance to Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul hated Christians. He plotted their demise. He was their most feared opponent. But when Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, everything changed. And Jesus and the Christian church gained its most fervent proponent. So resurrection is needed. His resurrection is recorded. And thirdly, our resurrection is revealed. So as you proceed in this chapter, Paul moves from Christ's resurrection to the Christian's resurrection, from his resurrection to our resurrection. And he, he speaks of these bodies. First, how they were sown. He uses that word sow or sown in the NIV about half a dozen times or so. And he says in verse 40, the, our bodies were sown earthly bodies. So we have earthly nature, we have made from the dust, we have earthly limitations. Uh, they're perishable, sown in, as perishable bodies in verse 42. Verse 43, sown in dishonor and weakness. In verse 44, they were sown a natural body. So you get the picture. Uh, and boy, was Paul right. <laughs> when did you first realize that your body was earthly and perishable and sown in dishonor and weakness. When did you first have that awakening, that reality check? In your 40s? Your 50s? 60s? I think for me it was bifocals. <laughs> and I, I was stupid. I was naive. I didn't think I, I will never need bifocals. Never needed them before. Why am I going to just wake up one morning and need bifocals? Yeah, when, when you're young like that, you, you just don't, you, you just think, I'll never get old. Oh, yes, you certainly will. <laughs> I've got many witnesses here that can verify that <laughs> because they were young too. But they, uh, they have earthly bodies just like you do, perishable bodies just like you do. Uh, someone once asked me if, if I had a new tent in my glasses, and I had to explain there is no tent. Those are the dark circles under my eyes. <laughs> That's what you get with a perishable body. And my hearing is going fast. You people just, you don't speak up like you used to. S enunciate clearly. Thank you. And my dentist, Dr. Rich Driller, is on speed dial. <laughs> Somebody brought up a song we used to sing. And, uh, and I rejoice in hearing that song. I thought of another one. We used to sing, uh, when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. I'm wearing mine now. <laughs> when did it hit you that your body is earthly? It is destined for an end. For me, maybe, it, maybe the final blow came when I went to Culver's and I told the young man behind the counter I was a senior because I wanted the senior discount, very important. And he said, I said, I'm a senior. And he looked at me and said, oh, like I couldn't tell? <laughs> yeah. I said, just ring it up, kid. 
When I was young on my day off, I would play tennis over the noon hour, and in the afternoon I'd play golf, and then in church softball in the evening. Today, any one of those requires medication and bed rest. <laughs> and the telltale sign is, is in the knees, the knees. The groans that accompany getting up from a chair are getting more frequent and louder. I can even hear them. <laughs> so getting old is not for sissies. These bodies are perishable. They have an expiration date. Paul says they are sown in weakness. But good news, gospel news, then he reminds us how these bodies not, that are not only sown, they're going to be raised. These bodies, he says in verse 42, are going to be raised imperishable. You have, I have that to look forward to. Verse 43, they're going to be raised in glory and in power. They're going to be raised a spiritual body. What does that mean? Well, I don't know everything it means, but I know it means no more eyeglasses, no more pain pills and dental bills, and no more groans. What does it mean? Well, all I've got to go on is the best thing to go on. All I've got to go on is apostolic truth, what Peter and John and Paul say. And Paul wrote to the Philippians, and he said, but our citizenship is in heaven. Don't forget that. Live every day without awareness that confidence that this is not all there is to life. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're going to have a home going someday, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, I mean everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like His glorious body. Woo! Even so come Lord Jesus. John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see Him, we shall be like Him. This is our resurrection, and Paul makes it clear. Our resurrection is a certainty because of His resurrection. Now, here's the question. Here's the question uh, someone always asks after a sermon like this, so I'll just put it up right now. The question, put that up there. What happens between the time we die and the time of our bodily resurrection? What happens between the time we die and the time of our bodily resurrection. Do we spend the, that time in a state of soul sleep? Some teach that. Some are wrong. I think the Scripture makes it clear there's not a moment, not a moment, when the believer's spirit is separated from God. Paul said, to die is gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus told that thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. In some beautiful heavenly form, our spirit will be in God's presence. And then on resurrection day, our spirits, our intellect, our capacity for love and joy, our ability to relate to God and others will be joined with our new body. So I, I don't know how it all plays out. I don't have any particular or special insight to any detail there. But you know what? Here's my, here's my stand. I'm not going to worry about it. And I would encourage you, don't worry about it. God's got it covered. He knows how to take care of everything. I love the, uh, I love the old spirituals. Man, I love listening to that music. So many of those songs were birthed out of pain and heartache and bitter disappointments in life. This one little song I recently discovered, um, 
was written by a 12-year-old who had a life-threatening disease, and his family and his friends all gathered around him. This is back in the 30s. Gathered around him, prayed for him, and the Lord touched him. And he wrote that song when he was 12 years old. The words to it are very simple, as most spirituals are. The reason I like them. The words are, there ain't no grave can hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm going to rise right out of the ground. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Sown perishable, raised imperishable. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. What a deal! But it's a deal only for believers, only for those who have put their faith in the crucified, risen Christ. Would you pray with me? I hope you have that faith in Christ. Listen, if you have it, you know it. Maybe you don't have it, and maybe, you, maybe you're at a point in your life when you're struggling with it. And I pray the Holy Spirit, through Paul's words, have given you a nudge in the right direction and moved you over into the eternal this morning. And I hope that you have come to a place today where you'll, you'll realize that the Christian life is not just a blind leap into the dark. No, there is historical context. There is rationale. There is a risen Christ. And even this morning, if you don't have that relationship with Him, you can. If you haven't received that assurance, that blessed hope, we call it, you can receive it this morning. You can live your wife, life in a new awareness of His presence and His power in your life. You know, miracles happen when you come to that point and you say, Lord, here's my life, I surrender to you. I'm telling you, miracles happen in heaven and on earth. In heaven, the, the angels rejoice. They record your name down in the book of life. On earth, the Holy Spirit is sent. He comes and He dwells within you, and you have a companion for life and beyond, one who will never leave you nor forsake you. He will give you strength. He will comfort you and guide you. He will empower you to live for God, to live in the light of of your future resurrection. You can do that today, and I pray that you will. Father, I thank you today for the good news in the good news, the gospel account, the Christ-centered account that Christ came and He died. He died for us. He died in our place, our sacrifice, our substitute, our sins, were crucified with Him. He was buried. The finality of it all was obvious. And three days later, there was an empty tomb. There was an angelic pronouncement. There were a series of appearances that changed lives and revolutionized the world. We thank you today for a living Christ. I pray that every man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice will yield to that divine prompting to put your faith in Christ. Trust Him, trust Him wholly, trust Him alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And now, Father, for every believer, may we live in the joy, the radical joy, the inexpressible joy, of being a follower of the risen Lord. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. God bless you. Would you please stand with me today? If you've made your decision for Christ, stop right out there at the Fresh Start Center. We have some materials we want to place in your hand. If you're struggling with that issue, that's all right. That material may help you and provide you with important information. But my fellow believers, I expect to see a smile on your face. 
a smile of joy and anticipation that the Lord's taking care of everything, even the end for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go and serve your risen Lord today. God bless you.